Hello again, welcome back. We're gonna um, finish up Kant in the video lecture tonight. Um, and before we kind of, we were right on the cusp of starting to talk about uh, what rules Kant thinks are the rules that we should be following if our actions are going to have moral worth. But let's do a little brief recap of the whole story before we, uh, or kind of the story up to the point that we got on Monday before we head off a little further. And I'm going to do some screen sharing with that um, diagram that we had before. Where is that here? Why is it not showing that? Man, for whatever reason, this image doesn't want to display. Okay, we'll just do this. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you and the ch everyone in the chat can see see this picture. Cool. Wonderful. So, um, the story began with Kant basically saying like, well, hey, morality is a concept we've got. This is a thing that we think about. Um, what, is, what, is this, what are we thinking about when we're thinking about morality? What's sort of the conceptual definition of this kind of thing? And that's where he offers this first proposition of morality, which says moral actions are actions done from duty. And all that he means by actions done from duty is aligning the will, condition one here, with what's necessarily and universally good. Um, so these two sort of conceptual components together is what we are talking about when we're talking about morality. This definition also is going to serve, as, as I was talking about on Monday's lecture, as a kind of recipe or a description of what we're looking for formally when we're looking for a moral law. So if we're wondering, like, what, it, what does it mean to be moral? What are the ultimate moral principles, like the first principles, like Mill was talking about? Um, Kant's saying it's going to come down to this. If there's moral truth, it's going to be something about the will. It's going to concern the will. And it's going to have to be able to uh, identify what's necessarily and universally good. So if, like I said on Monday... Um, Kant's not assuming that there is such an objective moral law out there. Um, he's kind of, I think he's sincerely searching after it. Um, and he's just saying, if we're going to find it, it's going to be something that meets this description. If there's something that doesn't meet this description, then we're not talking about morality anymore. Um, and on Monday I talked about especially why Condition 2 is something that Kant puts in there. Why morality can't only be about what is just contingently good, but why we need to find something that's necessarily and universally good. Okay, the next step was we were thinking about actions. So we know morality is about the will. So uh, the will is about actions. The will is the thing that determines how we act. And Kant was saying that there were two things that can uh, determine our actions. One thing that influences our will are inclinations. And the laws that govern our inclinations and the effect that they have on us are the laws of inclination. And these are causal laws. So they're identifying how we're, are, we're psychologically, sort of you could say, vulnerable to um, tendencies and patterns of behavior that are just uh, causal effects of other conditions. So sociological phenomenon, psychological phenomenon, neurological phenomenon, these are all, there are natural laws surrounding those things um, that influence us and direct our will, but not in ways that we um, control. They're not self-generated. They're not things that we designed. Uh, we are subject to them. They're also not conceptual. They don't rely on our understanding or awareness in order to influence us. And they're always going to be, because they're about the natural world um, and the circumstances of the natural world, they're always contingent. So, you know, human psychology didn't have to look the way that it does. It could have gone some other way. We could have had a different evolutionary history, and then our wills would be influenced in different ways than how they actually are. So any truths of psychology, any truths of uh, empirical science about nature, that's always about contingent things not what's necessary or universal. For that reason, Kant thought we weren't going to be able to find the moral law here. It's not meeting this condition about what uh, what could serve as a basis for something being necessarily or universally good, because this stuff is all contingent. It's all based on contingencies. 
But there's another way that our will gets determined according to Kant, and that's through self-generated laws. When we act on self-generated laws, we are acting intentionally. We are writing our own programming. We're able to come up with a kind of conceptual rule, a maxim or an imperative, um, that tells us uh, to do something under certain conditions in a certain pattern, um, and reason provides this. Oh, what was that? Oh, um, okay, maybe that was... Hello? You can hear me? Hmm, okay. I, I cut out for a second or something? Oh, really? Oh, dang. Uh, I'm looking over at the internet and it just jumped down. I don't know why the internet is so weak. Ugh. This is super frustrating. Is it? But it's better now? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, the other way that our will can be determined in action is through self-generated laws. Um, and these are rules we give to ourselves. They're conceptual. Um, they're how we intentionally act. So if I decide I'm going to do something, I'm, my behavior is going to be subjected to one of these maxims or imperatives, a, a, a conceptual rule I give to myself to direct my action. Um, anytime I'm like thinking about what to do and then decide to do something in a certain way, then I'm acting on self-generated laws. Now, um, we're going to talk more today about how uh, just because I'm thinking conceptually doesn't mean that I'm the complete author of my action. There's still some, there's some other things that can go on here with Kant um, where reason's involved, but reason isn't fully determining the will. Um, there can be kind of a mix here between self-generated laws and inclinations. Um, and that's like the difference between reasoning and rationalizing. And so we'll talk more about that um, uh, today. But at, up to this point in the story, Kant's saying, if an action is going to have moral worth, it has to, to even have a shot for this, it's going to have to be done from reason. It's going to have to be done from a self-generated law, not from laws of inclination. Inasmuch as we're acting, our will is determined by laws of inclination, we're basically just like that boulder example that I gave in uh, when, uh, Monday's lecture, or like uh, you're just like a robot playing out certain programming, um, and there's no morality to that. We don't blame morally the boulder for the uh, death of my friend on that hiking trip example. Um, we might say it's tragic and unfortunate, and the boulder is the thing that caused it, but we don't think the boulder is evil or made a bad choice, did something immoral or something. Those concepts just don't make any sense. Um, so uh, in as much as we are like those things, that we are objects that are subject to causal laws, there's no morality there. So if there's going to be any morality, it's going to happen over here in the world of self-generated laws. And where we're headed next here is, okay, so far, maybe we follow Kant up to this point. Next question would be, which self-generated laws uh, are going to generate actions with moral worth if we follow them? That's going to be the next question. And Kant's going to give us a little logic here. He's going to rely on some logic to help to explain how this is going to go. But for anyone in the chat, um, any kind of questions so far? There's a brief little recap. Back, back on, cool, wonderful. Um, another thing I was kind of talking about um, toward the end of Monday's lecture was how um, Kant doesn't think that we can make judgments. We can't morally evaluate our behaviors to tell whether they had moral worth or not, but we could still know what morality asks of us. Um, something that's sort of connected with that that also illustrates part of what Kant has committed to by saying... Um, the moral worth of my action is determined by self-generated laws, like what rule I'm following, what my intentions were. That's what he thinks it comes down to. Um, basically, for Kant, um, the moral worth of an action depends on why it was done. Like, kind of, for what reason did I act? Um, so what that also means is that if, say, he, Kant kind of talks about some of these examples in the reading. Um, let's say I'm uh, a good person in the sense of like 
my parents raised me right kind of thing. So what that means is my parents kind of trained me from an early age to follow certain moral rules, to like not kill, to not steal, don't lie, all this kind of stuff, to care for others. And and I, and let, let's put it this way, they, they brainwashed me. Like there's a kind of brainwashing that always happens through uh, childhood and kind of the influence your parents have over you. You're uh, you kind of need to develop the ability to think for yourself and critically reason. And up until that point, you're really absorbing all these ideas and values and cultures and stuff like that, um, not necessarily intentionally. You're it's this would be in the world of laws of inclination that I'm I'm psychologically influenced by my environment, including especially my parents. So I've been sort of trained into doing these things that morality demands. Kant would say if the only reason why I'm doing these good things is that I was like psychologically programmed in my character to seek those things out and do them, then that action doesn't have any moral worth. If I'm just doing it off of uh, these sort of feelings and things I've been programmed to have. And it's not so much like Kant's got a problem with goody two-shoes or something like that. It's really more like he, he says human character and virtue is far too fragile a foundation for uh, morality. He wants something more solid than that. So it can't be that like, well, morality is going to make sense to me as long as I was raised the right way. And if I'm not raised the right way, then morality just like makes no sense to me at all. And I think you see that idea and a, lo a lot of people are running around in our world thinking this way that like some people are just assholes. And there's there's like, you know, in, in some people they've got like a good heart they're concerned about others. They have human decency um, and sympathy and compassion and empathy. And then there's some people who just like don't. They just like lack it. And there's nothing you can do about those people. They're just animals, basically. Kant would be really staunchly opposed to that sort of thinking. He thinks that there is a path to moral guidance that doesn't depend on circumstantial things like whether you were raised well or not. So Kant would say he, he his favorite example of moral uh, an action with moral worth would be if like you weren't raised well and you have a really toxic personality and inner your inner psyche is just all messed up um, you've got terrible feelings and tendencies and desires like like taking pleasure in the suffering of others you're like can't help it I mean I see someone hurting and I'm just like <laughs> it's so hilarious or something it's like the automatic emotional responses that they have are just not wired up the right way if they still do what morality demands, what their duty demands, even though all of their tendencies psychologically and emotionally are going the opposite direction, then Kant's like, man, that's an action that's moral worth shines like a jewel. It's just unmistakable, he thinks. Um, I think this can be squared with his claim that we can't tell the moral worth of anybody's actions, including ourselves. Because even in a situation where, like, like Kant isn't a, as big of a fan of the case in which I uh, do good and I take pleasure in doing good, because it's really obscure, like, why did I do it? You know, like, did I just do it for the pleasure or did I do it out of regard for duty? Um, but, uh, and I, I think he likes the other case more because it's, like, harder to explain that person's behavior based on inclinations. Because if we know they just are full of bad inclinations then if it was going to be inclinations running the show, they wouldn't have done the good thing. But if they do it anyway, then that must mean, maybe, that they did it from just a pure recognition of what was good, rationally. Um, and Kant, So Kant maybe is thinking that's a little clearer. But I think I mean, you can still be skeptical in any actual situation. Um, yeah, maybe someone has bad tendencies. I mean, there's a little good tendency in there, too, and that's just why they did it instead of a recognition of the good. But the thing that Kant really believes, and this you might be skeptical of this, is he thinks no matter how you feel, you can rationally consider what is good, what your moral duty is, and follow it. Kant does believe in being able to act through reason alone. That you can, you know, the self-generated laws thing works all by itself and doesn't require any help from the inclination side. Um, inclinations might lubricate some of that stuff, but then again, Kant would say, in as much as your action was done only because you were causally compelled to do it, that's not really an action with moral worth as much. Um, I just saw, um, 
who is that? Uh, just dropped and got back. Um, are we having Nikki? Did you have any uh, connection problems again? Anytime I see people drop in and out. Okay, you're you're okay. Or maybe not. Um, I hope everything's okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, so that might also be helpful here. Like Kant's really thinking the action for an action to have moral worth, it really has to be something that you have chosen to do rather than something that was chosen for you. And I think we think about this a lot, like in terms of external causes, like. Um, if someone bribes me, or, or let's say, um, let's say someone tells me or forces me to do something coercively, then I didn't. I'm not really responsible for that, right? That's not me. That's them. Um, if I leave this room because two big guys come in here and pick me up and carry me out, then that wasn't me. But Kant thinks equally. Those compulsory forces are things that are happening inside of us through our own feelings, emotions, and psychology. So Kant doesn't want, if, if we only are doing actions because of those things, then it's not really us who's acting. Um, it isn't really coming from us. It's through the faculty of reason that I even have any kind of leverage here on directing my own course of action. Um, so if I'm going to be doing that, then I need to be doing it out of just a rational judgment, this is good and that's why I should do it kind of thing. Then reason's running the show, that kind of situation. So that's what Kant's looking for. Um, yeah, blackmail would be would be kind of an example of coercion for sure. Um, or someone like saying, give me your you know, lunch money or I'm going to punch you in the face kind of thing. Like bullying, um, those sorts of tactics. We would say, you know, in situations where that kind of coercive force is present, your freedom, your self-determination is not being respected, right? Those things threaten your autonomy. But Kant thinks all the forces inside of us psychologically just as much, if not more, threaten our autonomy. They take away our ability to be self-determining. Um, I think that's an important note about how Kant's thinking about all this. Um, my observation, maybe I should say observation, is that in contemporary American culture, we tend to think if it's inside of us, it's me. And Kant doesn't think that way. He's like, just because it's inside of your own mental world doesn't mean that's you. Doesn't mean that's what you are responsible for. Uh, for Kant, it's really reason alone that gives us this power of self-determination. Um, and, and we shouldn't really identify with anything else. We shouldn't identify with our emotional reactions to things according to Kant. Because that's not us. That's something that we are subject to. It might be part of import. It might be important for understanding the conditions under which my life has happened, and under which I exist. That I like face this kind of inner mental world. Um, but it's not what I really am, and it's not the choices that I make for sure. Um, so Kant would not consider it to be bad if we did something we were forced to do. Is that correct? Um, should not we try to reject to do such actions and fight for what is right to do and for things to be fair? Okay, some of these questions I'm going to hold off on until later. Maybe bring them up again later. Because right now we don't yet have like the full substantive picture of what Kant's proposing. But I can tell you this much right now. Kant does think that actions that are done from emotions are not free actions. And thus, they're not really answerable to moral evaluation. So really for Kant, this is something I'll talk about at the very end of the lecture. Hopefully we'll have time here tonight um, for me to get into this. Kant doesn't really believe in evil. He doesn't believe in intentional wrongdoing. If I'm being self-determining, Kant thinks I, the only way in which I can do this is if I'm following the moral law. Basically, following the moral law is what it means to be free for Kant. And, and he's not just saying that arbitrarily, because he's saying freedom is the power of self-determining, the, the rule by which I become self-determining is also the thing that serves as the moral law. So there's no way to freely act in a way that's contrary to the moral law. Which means, if I do act in a way that doesn't, um, if I'm behaving in a way that's inconsistent with the moral law, in some way, it's not really me that's acting. It's something else that's controlling my will. And the absence of my agency is a moral problem. And we should be working 
for that. We, I mean, both advocating for our own freedom, but advocating for the freedom of other people as well, and helping to encourage and um, empower them to be self-determining is going to be one of the core moral values for Kant. But that, but I'm getting ahead of the game here a little bit. Um, so this stuff will come back uh, by by the end of tonight for sure. Please hang, please hang on to it, Tanya, um, because if I forget, I'll ask you to remind me. Um, but that's good anticipation. Okay, so let's uh, let's get into the next step here. Um, what moral rules? What are the moral rules of all the rules I could give to myself for action? What are the ones that are going to result in actions with moral worth? That's the next question. And Kant's going to do a little um, logical breakdown here. So uh, let's take a take a little tangent here and step into the world of modal logic. Okay, and we're before we're going to talk about ethical stuff. Let's just talk about um, descriptive claims about reality. So um, maybe you remember from a previous lecture I was saying whenever we make claims, they come in one of two flavors, either descriptive claims about how the world is or normative claims about how the world ought to be. Moral laws will be in the normative category, but let's just talk about the descriptive side for a second. Um, and uh, I'll, 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 okay, I don't like to usually make things too political, um, but I'll use an example uh, that I used um, in my class this afternoon. And this is just for me personally, so, you know, um, I'm not trying to throw any shade or do anything like that right now. But um, when I make a claim about existence, I can make it in one of three different modes. And there might actually be some other variations on these, but the three basic ones are... Um, I could say something is actually true, I can say that it's possibly true, or I could say that it's necessarily true. And it's the same proposition in all three cases. So take this proposition. Donald Trump was elected president. I could say it's actually true that he was elected president, it's possible that he was elected president, or it's necessarily true that he was elected president. Now let's let's rewind the clock a little bit and imagine this is like um, the time when Donald Trump um, put his uh, bid in uh, for the nomination. So he hadn't yet be become the the Republican nominee yet um, when he first announced that he was running. Um, if you had talked to me back then, I'm totally fine being like absolutely candid about this. I I didn't think he had a chance. I thought there was no way that he would be president. So if someone made the claim Donald Trump will actually be elected president, I would have been like, yeah, no way, not going to happen. The evidence doesn't look good for that. Now, if someone had said to me the claim, it's possible that Donald Trump will be elected president, then I'd be like, yeah, totally, it's possible. To say that something is possible, to prove that, is not doesn't require very much evidence, right? To say this state of affairs is something possible doesn't require a whole lot. To say that it's actually what's going on, that requires some more evidence, and depending on the subject matter, especially predictions about the future, claims about what will actually happen, that those tend to be even more fallible. But there's way more evidence you need to be able to prove that something is actually true than to say that it's possibly true. Um, if I wanted to say that it's necessary, if I wanted to say a certain proposition is necessary, now I'm basically saying not only is it actually true, but it's actually impossible that it could have been any other way. It's impossible that it could have been false. To show that something is actually impossible is really difficult to do, that there is no other option. So like, it's true that Donald Trump it was and is actually elected president, but to say that Donald Trump was necessarily elected president means there were no other possibilities. And that's just not true in this case, um, because it's a contingent fact, not a necessary fact, that Trump was elected president. If circumstances had been different, then he wouldn't have been elected president. Like, just even think about the, the simple counterfactual possibility here that Donald Trump was hit by a bus before he got elected. Then he wouldn't have been elected president. Right? So even just that little change right there could make that not necessarily true. And that's a possibility. Could have been hit by a bus? Yeah, it's possible. In the same way that, you know, when he put in his bid for the nomination, I was like, yeah, it's possible he could be elected. Doesn't take much to prove that. So proving that something is necessarily true is really, really tough to do. You're basically saying there's no possibility in which this could have been false. That's pretty tough. But notice it's the same claim. 
Same judgment, just advanced with a different modal operator. Whether something is uh, possibly true, um, actually true, or necessarily true. And both possibility and necessity are about things that are contingent. Uh, as opposed to necessary, so you might know a little bit of where you think where where Kant's, where I'm going to go with this on Kant's behalf. Remember, he's looking for a recipe for a moral law that's going to identify what's universally and necessarily true. So anything, any kind of rule that we give to ourselves, like a maxim, an imperative, that only identifies something as being contingently good, can't serve as the moral law, um, because you can do the same game about possibility, actuality, and necessity with normative claims that you can say about descriptive claims. So if, is it possibly true, actually true, or necessarily true that Donald Trump was elected president, you can flip in the normative side and say, is something possibly good, actually good, or necessarily good? So instead of making judgments of existence, we can make judgments of value. Okay, so that's, that's what Kant's gonna do to kind of break down where could we find possibly a moral law? What would it have to look like? So let's go back to our little map here. Um, by the way, chat, how are things going? I want to check in. The explanations are going good so far? Wonderful. Thank you for the feedback. I appreciate knowing how things are going. Um, let's do this again, pull up this. So here in these two types that I've got in the diagram, um, we got what Kant calls hypothetical maxims and categorical maxims. Um, hypothetical maxims are always about something being conditionally or contingently good. Um, act, they're all rules that say do this for the sake of something else. They're kind of passing the buck on what's actually good here, what's the end of the action that I should perform. Um, and these can be split into two more categories. What Kant calls the problematic practical and the assertoric, those are actually technical terms from Aristotle. He's getting these from Aristotle, who's talking about those modal things of what's possible versus what's actual versus what's um, necessary. And But I, I think def these are kind of unwieldy bits of language. So I like to just call them skill maxims and happiness maxims. Skill maxims are about what's possibly good um, and happiness maxims actually make a commitment about what's actually good. Uh, so let's let's talk about these. Um, when we're talking about things that are possibly good, why would I call those skills? Well take some of the kinds of rules that you use to inform your behavior. Um, actually, uh, were you just uh, doing a jar? Yeah, Jocelyn, can you bring that jar over here? Object lesson. Perfect timing. This is a dangerous jar. It's a dangerous jar. It has ant killer in it. Oh, it's ant killer. Well, I need the, the lid. Well, oh, God. Eh, well it's, it's not that important. Here's a jar, right? Screw lid. You've got to probably, I don't know if you use this exact language for it, but you've got a belief in your head that reason gave you that if you want to open a jar, turn it to the left. If you want to close a jar, turn it to the right. Um, that's a skill, right? It's actually a skill my one and a half year old son does not have. He's having trouble with some of the screws he's okay with, but sometimes he's like, it's not working, right? He doesn't know how to open the jar because he hasn't learned this pattern yet. He doesn't have this rule, this rational rule for behavior. If I want to open the jar, turn it, unscrew it to the left, right? That's how it'll unscrew. If I'm trying to close the jar, turn it to the right. Okay, so that's that's a rational rule. It's something I think about when I'm deciding how to act with respect to jars. But that rule doesn't make any rational commitments to what's actually good. It's just saying something like, well, if, hypothetically, possibly, if it would be good to open the jar, then it's a good idea to turn it to the left. If it's a good idea to close the jar, then you should turn it to the right. But it's completely contingent whether the objective of opening or closing the jar would be a good thing. Okay, like maybe um, if the jar is full of honey, turning it to the left is a good idea because getting the honey is good. But if the jar is full of bees, then don't turn it to the left. Keep it keep it turned to the right. Don't want to open up 
the jar of bees and let them all out. Unless getting the bees out of the jar is a good idea. Like maybe I'm a beekeeper and I'm bringing in some new bees to my hives. But see how it's completely contingent. The knowledge about how jars work is a kind of practical reasoning. It's a kind of, lo there's a logic to it, and it talks about goodness, but only in possible ways. Like, it's only a possible good to turn it to the left if opening the jar is a good idea. Here's another example. Let's say um, I have the skill, again, back to this skill idea, I have the skill of being a badass ninja, which means I'm basically really good at killing people stealthily. That's my skill set. Um, you can imagine me having this skill. That, man, if it's a good thing to kill someone stealthily, if that's the right thing to do, then I'm the man for the job. I know exactly what are the good things to do to accomplish that outcome. Um, but you can imagine me having all the skills and being a pacifist, thinking that like killing people is always wrong, no matter what. I got the skills. I'm just not going to exercise them. And that's kind of maybe the best metaphor here for understanding maxims of uh, the hypothetical maxims that are problematic practical, that are uh, about skills, about what's possibly good, is that a skill, having a skill doesn't tell you if it's good to exercise it or not. Like when and where should you use it. The skill itself doesn't give you that insight. But it is relevant for making judgments of what is good to do. Right? Once I've got some other objectives set up, then maybe the skill maxims tell me what other things would be good if I'm trying to accomplish that. So this is kind of like basic means ends reasoning. Okay. Now, um, the, do this for the sake of that, as long as that's good, right? But remember, these all these hypothetical maxims are doing this, passing the buck on what is the ultimate end that you should be following. Okay. So that's the problematic practical. That's the the. Now let's talk about the assertoric. So the ones that I called happiness maxims. These are hypotheticals that say do this for the sake of being happy. Okay, this is the right thing to do because it'll make you happy. And we have these thoughts all the time. We have all this, these thoughts. Um, remember I said acting on desires directly would not be a rational action for Kant. If I'm not thinking about what I'm doing, I'm not doing something intentionally, then I'm just like a boulder. And some of our desires work this way, right? Like, um, Sometimes when I act on desires, I don't even recognize what I'm doing. Like, I just scratched myself. I was like, why did I scratch myself? Well, I felt uncomfortable, and now I feel better because I scratched. But I might not even think about that, right? It might just be a reaction or taking sips of water. I'm All my attention is focusing on what I'm saying in my lecture. But there's a desire for water. I'm thirsty, and I'm meeting that desire in action. But I'm not thinking about this. This is like an autonomic response. So I'm like the boulder. It's just a causal thing. Um, I'm not thinking about breathing, but I'm doing that, right? Um, and it's good, maybe. But a lot of times, desires creep into my moral reasoning through thinking, if my desire is satisfied, then I'll be happy. Okay? So happiness doesn't think is, like, obviously illegitimate as a goal. Um, it's saying this is something that's actually good. My conception of happiness is a vision of goodness for my life. And it's very possible that one of my conceptions of goodness for my life involves getting my desires satisfied, my preferences satisfied, basically utility. And this is where Mill shows up in the diagram. He shows up at this happiness maxim level. Um, and this is where Kant's going to ma majorly disagree with Mill. Um, so... If I have a vision of happiness, it's not just saying this thing is possibly good, it's making a commitment this thing is actually good. But Kant says all of those judgments about happiness are about contingent goodness. Why does he say that? Well, he's thinking like this. It's, it's not that dissimilar from how I describe some of Mill's thinking. Um, he's thinking, well, we have different ideas of happiness. My vision of happiness is not the same as yours. Why is that true? Um, well, it's not true necessarily because of something that's universal, but it's true because of contingencies. We've had different experiences, and those experiences sort of populate our imagination. Oh, I'm cutting off again? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, no. Um, well, I'm getting good reception here. 
Um, here, give me one second. I'm going to pop. Um, sorry for the interruption. I'm trying to recover what I was talking about. Oh, uh, right. Happiness maxims. So Kant's thinking um, all the, the reasons why we have different pictures and visions of happiness for ourselves is because of experience and the contingent circumstances of our own lives. Um, we're not all built the same way. We have different brains and different chemical things going on in our brains and we have different background experiences and ways that our character has been shaped, um, what we're emotionally sensitive to and what we're emotionally not sensitive to. These are all factors that kind of affect our visions of happiness. Um, and even over the course of your life, your vision of happiness, like my vision of my happiness right now is very different from seven-year-old Tim Lineman. Like he just loves Star Trek. <laughs> that was all it was about. Um, and nature. I loved nature. I always dreamed about having a cabin in the woods when I grew up. Um, and my picture of happiness is very different now. It really changed when I had a kid. Like that's that's also kind of something that affects things. So uh, Mill was talking about this too, and he was saying um, he was hoping for some kind of objective understanding of happiness, of utility. Uh, quality, if you remember the quality of utility stuff, by thinking about all possible experiences um, and gaining more understanding through experience of everything that life has to offer and figuring out which stuff kind of weighs for more, what is higher quality and lower quality. Um, but it's all really contingent. It's a contingent journey. We're maybe learning more and more, but we're not getting the necessary answer. And that's what bothers Kant. Kant actually has a footnote where he basically anticipates a bunch of stuff that Mill's talking about in utilitarianism um, about happiness. But here, here's the big kicker for Kant. Um, we, he says in the footnote, he says, if we had access to, if we had all the possible experiences that anyone could ever have, which includes like alien psychologies and stuff too, then maybe we would be in a position to be able to know um, what true happiness is, like this objective vision of happiness. Um, but we're not there. We're not there. So he's like, I can't use that as a basis for um, my moral theory because it needs to be about something necessary. So Kant famously says, and this, this often gets misinterpreted, so this is a danger zone here. Be careful with this. But uh, Kant famously says, the purpose of morality is not to make people happy. Happiness is not the point of morality. Uh, he says it's to make people good, not to make them happy. But we'll revisit happiness. We'll come back to happiness here because there is a way that even though morality is not centrally about happiness for Kant, happiness is a good. It's just a contingent good. It's not a necessary good. Um, okay, okay, Tanya. I'm sorry that this hasn't been working for you. It, it just started cutting off again? Like ever since we tried restarting yeah for you too okay I'm gonna pause this for a second that was an experiment um, I'm gonna okay okay uh, my apologies to you youtubers too who are watching this video and it keeps cutting in and out and me talking about the connection I know that's annoying okay so so Kant's not cool um, using happiness as a foundation for his moral theory because it can't talk about what's necessarily good at least from our fallible position where we don't have access to all the evidence. Um, it's kind of similar to how if we were scientists and we knew all the observations that are possible to have about the natural world, then we'd be in a position to give a grand unified theory of physics that would include everything, like a scientific theory of everything. We're not there. so. All of our knowledge about the natural world is kind of contingent. We don't see how it all hangs together with necessity. Uh, we are, you know, that picture's coming into focus, but there's a lot of other things we haven't observed about it. And the more that we learn, the more we learn about what we don't know, too, in science. So um, could you have a science of, of natural necessity? Yeah, theoretically, only if you had everything. And we don't have everything. So we're working on it and making progress. But it's not something, all the answers that we have are not necessary answers. And that's why periodically scientific results are getting overturned and we rethink things and paradigm shifts occur and all that kind of stuff. Kant's like, that can't happen with ethics. There has to be something more solid here. Um, so he, he, will, he doesn't take the route that Mill takes. There's another thing that's important here, the contrast between Mill and Kant um, and utilitarianism and, and Kant's version here. Um, 
Mill is thinking we could say, and, and Kant kind of concedes this point. He's like, is everyone concerned about happiness? Well, yeah, yeah, that's pretty fair to say. Um, everyone values happiness. But you, he, Kant thinks you can't separate an abstract out a value on happiness itself as an abstract entity. He says, whenever I want my happiness, what I want is not happiness, whatever that is, but this particular vision of it. Like when I have desires for something, my desire is not for my desire to be satisfied. It's for just in the abstract. It's for this desire to be satisfied. So Kant kind of thinks it doesn't make sense to make the theoretical move that Mill does when he reduces all of our pictures of happiness to this theoretical idea of utility, preference satisfaction. That's a big move for Mill, because if you remember how I was describing it when we were doing the Mill lectures, it's kind of like um, a reduction to a common currency. All the things we value can be measured in this utility thing, this abstract utility concept, a theoretical concept of utility, and then we can start comparing these things against each other. And Kant's like, no, I don't think that you can do that. You can't perform that reduction um, to saying that there is this thing that is universally desired, utility. You can't abstract that away from the particular things that we want. And actually, in this respect, he follows Aristotle. Aristotle says the same thing about pleasure. He says, pleasure itself is not something you can desire. What you can desire are particular pleasures, but every pleasure has its own, like, flavor, Aristotle says, that you can't um, sort of separate out from from the pleasure itself. Um, uh, it's like, uh, maybe it's kind of like this. Um, I can't separate out or abstract away the taste of soda pop from a particular flavor of soda pop, right? Like, I can have Coke, or I can have a Dr. Pepper, or a Sprite, or something like that, but I, I can't sort of abstract away the soda pop flavor. It's I'm always experiencing a particular soda pop, something like that. Um, I, I just came up with that metaphor just now. I'm not, I might have to think about how good it is. But <laughs> it, it came to mind. I, I think that captured pretty good. Um, we'll talk more about Aristotle and pleasure when we get to Aristotle. But so much Kant would say for um, happiness. Um, it will come back. It will return. But it, it, he rejects it right now. Uh, as a moral foundation um, uh, for what is necessary in morality because it is still contingent, according to him. Okay, so what does Kant think the moral law could be? Well, there's only one option left, categorical maxims. And what makes a maxim categorical? Well, it means it doesn't have this do this for the sake of this other thing kind of logical form to it. Both of the two, the skill and happiness maxims we talked about are saying, this thing is a good thing to do. This is good for the sake of that thing. This thing makes that happen, so that's why that that this thing is good because it makes this other good thing happen. So happiness maxims are saying, like, I should act this way or I should pursue this result because if that happens, I'll be happy and happiness is good. Okay. If I'm doing the skill thing, it's like, well, if... Um, turning the jar to the left will open the jar and the contents of the jar are something that would be good to have access to then it's good to open the jar to turn it to the left right um, so it's all this conditional stuff categorical maxims say this thing is good not in a conditional way at all not no contingency they just say this thing's good end of story no caveats on that no conditions this thing is intrinsically good it's unconditionally good. It's good across all possible circumstances. There's no counterexamples. There's never a circumstance in which the thing that in other cases would be good, in this case, is bad. So categorical maxims have that logical shape to them. They have that logical form to them. They're claims of what is necessarily good. Impossible to be not good. right? If you think back to the modal logic thing of possibility, actuality, necessity, if something is necessarily true, that means it's impossible for it to be false. If something is necessarily good, that means it's not possible. There's no circumstances under which it is not good. Okay, So, um, pretty big commitment. And Kant says, there really is only one categorical maxim that could actually be true. I can design all sorts of categorical maxims, but they're just absurd. They're full of counterexamples. Like, I'm like, 
Mm, maybe eating cheeseburgers is always good intrinsically for itself, unconditionally, no strings attached. But it's like, I can't really endorse that. Like, once I've had maybe two cheeseburgers, I'm like, that's it. It's not the time to eat a cheeseburger after two. I don't want another one. Um, or if I'm, um, uh, let's just say, in a wedding ceremony, it's like, that's not a good time to eat a cheeseburger, right? Eating a cheeseburger isn't good in those circumstances. Um, or if I, you know, I can come up with endless counterexamples here of uh, times in which eating a cheeseburger is not a good choice. Um, but any of the, I mean, that's kind of a silly, absurd example. But any of the things that we think of as good, even things like empathy, compassion, wisdom, patience, you can find circumstances in which the thing that would be generally good, not always good. So it can't be necessarily good, and that means it can't serve as a moral foundation. It can't be an absolute condition of morality. Um, so Kant, uh, this, is, this is where, when I was saying that Kant doesn't presuppose that there is going to be a moral law, this is where the rubber really hits the road. Is there anything that we can say is unconditionally and necessarily good? Is that even possible? Um, any rule that I should always be following no matter what. Um, and uh, Kant thinks, yeah, there's really not any good candidates here, except for one little tiny thing, one little thing. And let's, before I give it to you, let's talk about uh, Kant's reasoning here. Uh, this is um, a little connected with what I was, you know, when I was talking on Monday, I said, Usually when I teach Kant, I do this kind of like background in Kant's general philosophy. This is where it's really helpful to know some of the rest of Kant's uh, stuff and how he thinks about all philosophical problems. Um, and I, I can't, I, for just for the sake of time, it just doesn't make sense to run through the whole thing right now. But I'll, I'll try to give you some kind of quick and dirty sketch of, of what he uh, is thinking. So Kant's kind of wondering, he does, this is... Uh, the, that's so hard to explain quickly. Um, a lot of Kant's philosophy is kind of like reverse engineering existence or experience or thought or judgment. It's sort of like, well, hey, we're doing science. Uh, science is a thing we do. Um, how, how are we able to do this? Like, what is required in order for me to be able to think about the world in terms of cause and effect relationships? Um, how am I able to do math? How am I able to uh, use language? Um, like, what what has to be going on in the background of the mechanics of my mind to just make cognition happen? This is a big part of Kant's philosophy, all this kind of philosophy of mind stuff. Um, so, uh, when it comes to ethics, Kant wants to do the same thing. And he's wondering, okay, we make judgments of what's good. We may not be entitled to them. Like, we might make false judgments. We might think something's good, it's not actually good. We can, you know, we disagree about all this stuff. So much contingency in what we consider as the objects of value. But the fact remains, we make judgments of value. We do say things are good. This is a judgment we're capable of making. There's, there's a logical content to this. What is going on that enables that to happen? Is there something that is logically or rationally required to be able to make any judgment of goodness ever, no matter what the object is or the content of that judgment? Um, is there something that I need to commit to to open up the possibility of making any judgment of goodness, period? And Kant thinks there is one thing. And again, he goes back to logic for a guide here. Um, just a little quick check-in. I promise I won't... Uh, ask again or get too annoying with this but for those of you still in the chat audio video going good not cutting out dang it oh man okay I'll, I'll think about this if if we get consistent internet troubles for these lectures, um, my home internet is like maybe not going to be up to the task. And the only way I really have around with that is to do these at a different time. So maybe I'll, I'll send out an announcement and see if um, there are other times during the week that people would be free for these things. 
Um, I picked the evening because I thought this probably works the best with people's work schedules and things like that. Um, I do have time in afternoons um, on weekdays to do this earlier in the day, and then I could do it like on campus at school with their internet, which might be more reliable than my home stuff that I've got going on here. Um, that's actually what I'm using, Nikki. Um, that's my only access. Um, I'm a poor college instructor, so fancy high-speed internet is not something I pay for. Um, so that's a problem. Um, okay. Well, we'll kind of tough it out tonight, and, and maybe I'll think about other solutions here. Um, if it gets really bad and you just want me to repeat something, let me know. Um, okay. So... Um, so Kant thinks, so he's getting a kind of a clue here again from logic. So let's, let's now just go back to the world of descriptive claims. Uh, like if I'm a scientist, um, and I'm offering, um, a theory about what's going on in reality. Sienna, I'm sorry it's been so unreliable for you. That really upsets me. Um, so if I was going to offer you a scientific theory... And I've got all this kind of research and evidence and charts and stats and all this kind of stuff. Um, but if my theory, like what I'm proposing about reality, ends up contradicting itself, it's like I'm saying something is both true and false simultaneously, then you don't really need to even look at my evidence. You know that my theory can't possibly be correct. Um, contradictions can't happen. And I don't know if there's anyone out there that studies quantum physics uh, I think some people have thought that what quantum physics shows us is that contradictions can happen. I don't think those arguments are very convincing. I've looked into this kind of thing. Um, I don't think that quantum mechanics is saying uh, black is white and white is black and this kind of thing. Um, up is down, down is up. Nothing means anything anymore. Um, quantum physics is saying here's a thing that's really happening this is a real phenomenon, as opposed to it not being this way. I mean, quantum physics totally upset our understanding of the natural world because it was a pattern of understanding what's going on that it does not fit with the pre-existing patterns that we have. So they're contradicting something else. That means they're standing for something positively. So um, I think the law of non-contradiction, this, this law that all of logic is built on, that for every claim it's either true or false, it can't be both true and false, and it can't be neither true nor false, that's still pretty secure. And without it, if, if it goes, then um, by most accounts, all of logic goes. There's some people who try to do some non-standard logics, but again, I don't think that they're very convincing. They're, they're, not, they're not there yet. Um, and I don't think they're going to get there either. But Kant's trying to use, basically, the normative equivalent of the law of non-contradiction. If you want to do an action with moral worth, if we're wondering, like, what, what could be something that could be necessarily good, if I'm going to make any other judgment of good, for that to be possible, to even even have a shot of being true, it can't contradict itself. And so Kant says, well, that's something that's always good. You know what's always good under all circumstances? Not contradicting yourself, your own judgments of what is good. If you're saying it's good, it's good. Um, you can change your mind. There's no problem with that. If I change my mind, I'm not contradicting myself and my judgment. If I'm saying this thing is good and not good simultaneously, then I got a problem. I'm not being consistent. Another way to think about this is double standards. So if I'm like, here's the standard, and then I behave in a way that completely rejects that standard, you're like, this dude's a hypocrite. I, I don't care what his values are. That can't be right. Whatever's going on. It, you can't have a shot of it if it's hypocritical. Or holding double standards. So Kant's saying that's something that's good no matter what else. All the other contingencies, any possible circumstances, there's never a good situation for contradicting yourself. There's never a way in which a co contradicting yourself is a good thing. Can it be a good thing for you to change your mind? Absolutely. Because maybe you're like, my original idea has a problem with it. Kant's not trying to say like, once you made your bed, you better sleep in it kind of thing. That's not his point. Um, his point is that whatever position you're going to commit to as being good can't be a self-contradictory position. Now, there is a lot more to say here in terms of what Kant means by a contradiction, and so we've got to be careful about this. 
um, and I want to actually bring up my lecture notes to explain this. So, so that that sentiment though, this idea of not contradicting yourself is something that's always good, that it's unconditionally good, no matter what else we're talking about. Kant thinks without that, any judgment of goodness I make is unintelligible. If even if I'm saying something is contingently good, sometimes good, sometimes bad, again there has to be some kind of consistent rule about this. And if there isn't a line drawn in the sand there about when is it good and when is it bad that I'm staying consistent on, if it gets contradictory with itself, then I don't even know what you're saying. Like what do you mean to say this thing is good if you're also saying that it's not good at the same time? Like what's your position? <laughs> right? It isn't there isn't anything to work with there. Okay? Um so this is something that Kant thinks has universal legitimacy. It's something that's necessary to make any judgment of goodness, um, and it is itself always good. There's no circumstance in which it could be asserted that it's not good. It's impossible for it to be not good. There's no scenario. Um, but like I said, there's what what it means to be able to uh, avoid a contradiction has some extra conditions to it, and particularly this idea about universalizing. So Kant's talking, he's going to talk here when I show you his formulations of this master moral law, what he calls the categorical imperative. Um, you'll see him talking in terms of this universalizing, and that's pretty important. So let's let's take a look at kind of a technical definition here, and I'll which I'll try to explain. Um, and um, and we'll try to cash it out with some examples and things. Come on. Let's do this now. There we go. All right. So you should be able to see my lecture notes here. So down here, categorical uh, imperative, right down here. Now, um, you remember my metaphor about uh, I was talking about um, blood from a stone. This is the stone. This like thin logical principle. It might sound like a like a loophole or some kind of sleight of hand, like some kind of cheap shot or something circular or trivial or something like that. But if Kant's right, he can get some pretty cool things to fall out from this. The idea of not contradicting yourself could sound really, really thin, like um, like it may not give you any actual moral guidance in life at all. Like I could take a maxim that says, um, Tim Linneman is the only thing in the universe that matters. And I'm not contradicting myself, right? That's a consistent thought. It doesn't have a double standard on the face of it, but does it really? And Kant's going to say, yeah, because the rules that you're thinking of acting on, you have to be considering from the standpoint of what is universal. That means all possible contingencies. So that's where this universalizing idea is going to come from. So let's take a look at it here. Um, this first formulation Kant calls the formula of universal law, and it's saying act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, without contradiction, will that it should become a universal law. I'm sorry, Nikki. Um, sorry to see you go. Uh, I wish I had this better for you. My apologies. Um, so act uh, only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. One way to think about this is sort of this idea of... Um, if it's a rule that applies for me, then it has to apply for you. Like, I need to allow it to work for you, too. So if it's okay for me to do it, then it's got to be okay for you to do it. Uh, remember, again, a maxim is just any sort of rule or intention I'm setting for myself. I'm like, under this circumstance, I should do this. Okay. So if I'm going to be able to assert that maxim without a contradiction, I have to think about it from the context of it being a rule not just for me, but for everybody. This actually um, may not sound totally uh, unfamiliar because this is kind of the move that Mill was making when he was in that step of his argument in defense of utilitarianism where he was generalizing. Remember, he starts from saying something like, um, well, we all individually value our own utility. So from there, we're rationally committed. Like if I'm going to say it's good when I get what I want, then I have to say it's good when you get what you want too. I'm like rationally uh, required to agree to that. Um, I'm going to turn off the baby monitor here. Um, I have to, on pain of contradiction, I have to accept that. 
And that's what Kant's thinking too. When we form judgments about like, this is good, we're not always thinking about it from the standpoint of, this is good for Tim Linneman to have this thing. Right? I'm just thinking like, this is a good thing. That's why I want it in my life. And so I got to think about it as good universally. Okay? And I might contradict myself there. How could that happen? I'll tell you in a second. But before we do that, let's talk about the second formulation, um, which is very closely tied to the first. The, the first two kind of taken together are the starting point of Kant working out his moral theory. Kant actually says, incidentally, he says um, all these different formulations are logically equivalent, which means they're all just basically the same idea set in different ways. I don't think he's right about that. I think he's pretty wrong about that. Um, that he doesn't have the right view of his own theory. But uh, what I think he is right about, or he could be right about, is that from these first formulations that are just talking about this bare idea of like contradicting yourself is bad all the time, it's always good to not contradict yourself, that the other more intense, richer, like the blood from the stone thing, the blood part, all of those follow logically from the first ones. So if Kant's able to get those in place, then we can start saying, well, if that's true, then that's going to mean this is true. Like, moral action is going to have to look like this. And if that's true, then this is going to have to follow too. So that's where this is kind of going. Um, so let's go back to my lecture notes here. I'm going to pull those up. So here's the other one. Uh, this concern about what's happening with the will. Formula of the law of nature. Act as if the maxim of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. Now, this, if you, you might be puzzled here because you might be thinking, wait a second, Kant, didn't you just say if you're acting from a law of inclination, which are natural laws, that your action doesn't have any moral worth? And that's true. That's why Kant is saying, act as if. So this is kind of, imagine it as like a rule that tells you to do some hypothetical thinking. Like, you don't have the power to make something happen just by willing that rule. Like, when you act on that intention, that doesn't control everyone else's will. If anything, maybe it at most controls your will, but nobody else's. But what if you imagined the choices that you're making as having those kinds of stakes to them? That you're basically making a decision on behalf of all people. What could you will thinking about it in that situation? So when he's saying act as if, what is the as if? As if by acting on this rule in this moment, you are setting and programming the pattern of behavior for everybody else. Not just that it's a rule that applies to everyone like a universal law. But by calling it a, a universal law of nature, Kant's saying like, what if they actually acted on that rule? perfectly kind of like a utopian idea um, so it's basically saying if you're thinking it's good for doing this you got to imagine what if everyone did that what if everyone followed the advice that you're giving to yourself perfectly can you will such a world is that a will uh, a world that you would um, approve of that you would think is a good one what, could you make that kind of choice it's kind of a high stakes choice in that moment um, and that might seem a little confusing, too, about like what Kant is asking for here. So let, let's talk about some illustrations. Let's talk about some example scenarios of using the categorical imperative that demonstrate those two principles. Um, and maybe we can get a kind of a sharper picture here for what does it look like to follow Kant's categorical imperative? Like how should it be applied into specific situations? Okay. By the way, if anyone has done the reading um, from the, the grounding of a metaphysics of morals, Kant gives four famous examples. Two of them are crap and will mislead you about Kant's own theory. And I, I'm always like, um, Kant does this in a bunch of his writings where he's got this like really solid theory, and then he starts commenting on it and like what follows from his theory. And then you're like, wait a second, that doesn't seem to be consistent with what you're talking about theoretically, Kant. And I'm really surprised, um, it, it's, it's still kind of a mystery to me that he can misunderstand his own theories so badly in certain places. Um, but, you know, stuff, we're, we're human, we make mistakes about this kind of thing. Um, and believe me, I've tried to find a way to make this stuff consistent for him, because it's like, how, could he really make a mistake that bad? But it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe he did. 
That that's kind of my two cents on it. But let's talk about the two of the examples he offers. I think are really good. So let's talk about those. One of them is this rule that says no lying promises. That if I'm going to act morally, I you know that would be an immoral action. I have an obligation to not make lying promises. Um, so uh, Kant sort of paints the scene like this. He's like, imagine a person, imagine you maybe, you don't have money, you need money, and you're like, how can I get some money? And you're like, well, hey, those banks over there got a lot of money just sitting around, and they'll give it to you if you just promise to pay them back, aka a loan, right? But let's say you know that you're in a position where you're like, if I take out this loan, there's no way I'm going to be able to repay it. Okay, so what I'll do is kind of posture and pretend like I'm intending to pay it back when I have no intention to do so, and I know that's just not going to be possible for me. Um, so I'll make a lying promise to the bank to get the loan, to get the money that I need that would be good for me. Okay, so that's the kind of maxim that the person, maybe if you're thinking about yourself here or this or whoever's in this example, that's the maxim that they're considering following. You know, that's their plan, right? The rule, the conceptual rule that they set for themselves, their intentions for how they're going to act, has that pattern to it. Um, but before they act on it, Kant's like, they still at least have enough moral sense to see if it passes the categorical imperative. So think of the categorical imperative as kind of like a test that you run on other things that you want to do, on other rules for behavior that you're considering to see whether they're going to be consistent with what morality demands. And so far, all morality demands is don't contradict yourself. Not a, not a big deal. But we're going to see some things fall out from this, right? Okay, so um, if I'm imagining this as a universal law, it's like I'm imagining what if it's like an open thing for everybody that when you need money and you don't have it, um, you make a lying promise to get the money. If that was considered morally permissible behavior, like I'm thinking about acting that way in this moment if I'm the person in the story. I'm thinking about following that rule right now, thinking that's a good idea. Um, what if that was uh, generally accepted? That we know like this this is something it's okay to do. Um, what would happen? And Kant says, no one's going to, basically promises won't mean anything. If we know that it's morally permissible to make lying promises, then you could make all the promises you want. You're not going to get any money from any banks. They're not going to give out any loans anymore uh, to people. If they know that it's totally fine, there's nothing morally wrong, it's acceptable to make lying promises, then people are, are not going to trust any promise that's given. Promises only mean something if they're backed with some moral obligation to not break the promise. Now, do promises get broken? Yeah, they get broken. But you, to act intentionally, to make the lying promise, that's not morally permissible behavior. Now, there, are, there might you might try to try the same shtick with other things, but it might not work quite as good. And maybe some of these things would not involve contradictions. For example, stealing bread to free, feed your family um, if you're too poor to be able to buy the bread. Right? Would stealing be wrong? Kant doesn't think so, but he's kind of a, he's got a, he's kind of a stick in the mud about this stuff. As someone who, like has the general idea of Kant's theory and, and kind of agrees with it, I, I think there could be some room for this kind of thing. I can imagine a society in which everyone knows that if you're too poor to be able to pay for the bread, just take it. Like, society's not going to fall apart if that happens. Um, and maybe under those very special contingent circumstances, when, like, whether your family is going to live or not is what's at stake, that is totally fine. And that's that's an important point here about universalizing maxim or maxims that can be universalized without contradiction they can be conditional the categorical imperative is not condi conditional you know to not contradict yourself is something always good but the rules that i'm thinking about universalizing without contradiction they could be contingent if you remember back from uh, monday's lecture when i was talking about why kant thinks it's important for uh morality to be about what's necessarily good and we we're saying like the con Something sometimes good, sometimes bad, but that requires a rule that's staying consistent over all those cases. And maybe that rule isn't always good. It's contingently good. In other cases, the rule doesn't apply. But then there's got to be another rule, which shows the difference between that. And so on and so forth, eventually, until we get to a universal rule. Well, Kant's universal rule is the categorical imperative. 
and you can maybe start to see a little bit of a picture about how more conditional rules are going to follow from that. Like, on what grounds could I uh, start making claims about what is contingently good? Okay, and actually we're going to do that with happiness in a second here. Let's finish off this story and then I might want to take a little break. I'm starting to feel a little lightheaded from talking so much. Um, whew, breathe, Tim. Um, so, uh, so in the lying promises case, if it was universal, then the whole thing breaks down. And, and really where the contradiction comes from in the lying promise case is that at that point, if it's a universal law, if I follow my rule here, it won't get me the good thing I'm looking for. I can make all the promises in the world. I won't get the money. If it's a universal rule, it won't work. And Kant's saying any rule that won't work when it's taken universally, that's a rule that's contradicting yourself, itself. Um, and it can't be a, a maxim that could yield an action that's morally okay. So that that's how that's going to work. Now there's the second one, right? The, the concern about contradiction in the will, the formula of the law of nature. Um, this is a little different. So um, the example that Kant uses for this one is um, a case of charity. So he's saying, imagine you're walking down the street and you see a homeless person sitting there with a sign and everything. So someone in need, and um, let's say you're in a position where you're not in need. Um, you're in a position to be able to help. Uh, so you could help, you could help, and the person needs help. Okay. You might think to yourself, you know, if I went over there and kicked the guy, that would be immoral. I'm not going to harm this person. That To positively harm them would be wrong, right? For me to kick them when they're down kind of thing, that wouldn't be a good idea. But I don't have to help them, right? Isn't it morally permissible for me to just walk on by and not help them? So that's the maxim you might be considering to act on. And Kant says, okay, let's run that through the categorical imperative, see what happens. So when I'm trying to universalize the maxim without contradiction, and I'm thinking about the, the formula of law of nature, um, I have to imagine, uh, what if everyone followed that rule? Not just that it was like a rule that applies to them, but what if they actually perfectly followed it? So everyone's running around where their behavior is being programmed uh, about um, whenever people are in help uh, and they need help and you can help them, don't help them. What if everyone perfectly followed that rule and acted as you're thinking about acting in this situation right now? Could you will such a world? It might be tempting to think you could if uh, you're in the position that you currently are. right? So if you're... If you're doing fine, if you're not in need, you're like, yeah, I don't care. Sure, no one needs to help me. I'll be fine. I don't need other people's help. I, that's, I can will such a world. That's cool. If I'm the rich person, right? Um, but Kant's saying, well, you're not universalizing hard enough. You have to imagine this under all possible circumstances. What's a possible circumstance? You're not rich. You could be the person in need. And even if today, you it's kind of like... Um, a kind of a wisdom that you might think about um, just on your own. You might have thought th about this before Kant, where it's like, you know, I might be doing right, fine right now in my life, um, but who knows what will happen in a year, five years, ten years. People can go, you know, they can go up and down all the time in terms of where their life is at and what, and especially with things like wealth, right? Um, so you never really know, like, what position are you going to be in? What rules do you want to be structuring society if you're not sure, you know, where you're going to be in society, you kind of need to think about all the options, not just the ones that apply to your contingent circumstances. That's what Kant's saying. He's saying when you're thinking about the rules that are going to generate moral action, you can't just be thinking about your circumstances. You've got to be thinking about all the possible circumstances that you or anyone else could be facing. And Kant's thinking if you were in need, you wouldn't will that other people would not help you if they were in a position to help you and you need help. Right? You wouldn't will that. So you're getting into a contradiction in your will. Why? Because under different contingent circumstances, you're going to will one thing, and under different circumstances, you're going to will something else. That means you're holding a double standard. That means you're contradicting your own will. And a lot of times we are doing this, like all the time. Like Kant, Kant thinks um, the amount of uh, self-centeredness that we have, and not just self-centered in terms of 
what happens to me matters, but that I'm using my life and my contingent circumstances as the frame of reference for what has objective value and what's proper behavior. Oh man, he thinks that's happening all the time. That, that kind of egoism is a constant threat uh, to our moral status, according to Kant. So we, it's kind of like, um, I, sometimes Kant gets thrown under the bus for like, um, that he's like too focused on reason or something like this, and he doesn't have compassion and empathy and, and stuff like this. I don't think that's true at all. Um, even though he's a little dry, I think if you're looking at the theory, Kant's really encouraging... Um, or I, I sometimes talk in terms of like there's this like Kantian care and Kantian empathy. It's got its own his own kind of twist on this. But like in this moment right now, I think Kant is talking about a kind of rational empathy. That I when I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, I need to be thinking about what other people's situations are like and what rules are they maybe thinking about following, and what would make sense for a pattern about how human life should go that is relevant across the board to people no matter their circumstances. That might seem like a superhuman task, but it's actually maybe not completely outside of our grasp. I mean, we do this all the time, and we don't necessarily need to feel feelings of sympathy with people to be able to kind of put ourselves in their shoes. I can, like, imagine theoretically, what if I was in these circumstances? Or what about those considerations? There, there's that possible impact too. What should, you know, all those things given together, what should we do? Um, someone we're going to talk about much, much later in the quarter. Um, but I'm, I'm going to kind of foreshadow him now, I think, because he is a Kantian. Um, this is a philosopher, 20th century philosopher named John Rawls. We'll, we'll talk about him when we do social and economic justice. So you'll probably hear me tell this whole story again. But I'll, I'll try to give you like a little sneak preview of him. Um, he, I think he really helps with understanding Kant's mentality here. But Rawls, he's really suspicious of uh, different, uh, the kind of the debate around social justice. Like we have all these different visions of what social justice ought to look like or what are the moral values that we're identifying as the standards for a just society. And um, Rawls is really skeptical because he thinks everyone's biased. He thinks rich people want to opt for a, a, a notion of social justice that's all about freedom and liberty, like free market, libertarian kinds kinds of things. Why? Because it lets them have more power with the money they got, right? They can do what they want with what they have. That's the rule for everybody. Well, that's great if you've got a lot. Uh, it's not so great if you're poor. But um, Rawls thinks, you know, the other side of the coin, how we might define social justice in terms of equal distribution of resources or people's well-being, that like kind of uh, socialism or communist sort of vision of social justice, he thinks, yeah, that looks attractive if you're poor or weak and you're not in a privileged position in society, then that's what you're, that's what we, is a conception of social justice you'll agree with. Why? Because it benefits you in your position in society. So Rawls is like, um, how can we figure out what is actually objectively, rationally the proper conception of social justice? And uh, in a way that we could resist all these biasing forces that cast suspicion and doubt on any of our attempts to figure out what's socially just. Um, the other alternative is just straight up cynicism and saying, nah, it's impossible to tell because everyone's biased. You know, game over. And Rawls isn't going to say game over. And so he comes up with this thought experiment where he's like, okay, imagine this. Ima I'm embellishing here a little bit, but... Imagine that all of our souls got sucked out of our bodies and went to the moon. And we're going to, on the moon, we're going to have a big discussion about what structure of society we think we should have. So we're going to basically sit down, have a big massive consensus discussion about how we're going to set up the rules of society. But here's the kick. Um, once our souls leave our bodies, after we have this conversation, they're going to go back to the same bodies. But while we're having the conversation on the moon, while my soul is out of my body, I don't know which body is mine. I don't know which person back on the planet I'm going to be. So uh, this is what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. So when I'm having this debate and discussion with all the other souls about how we're going to structure society, I kind of need to be thinking about everyone, because every possible position that's down there, because I don't know, that could be me. And Rawls is thinking... You don't have to take selfishness out of the equation 
to get to justice. As long as you just take the information of people's knowledge of their contingent circumstances out of the picture, you're going to automatically be thinking in an altruistic universal sort of way. It's a very interesting trick that Rawls is pulling, and I think it's very inspired by Kant. That really the the imagining of like what would be the considerations that would convince me to endorse one proposal over another when I'm in that veil of ignorance is basically the same thing as the kind of rational imagination I need when I'm thinking about what rules can I agree to universally that I can universalize under the categorical imperative without contradiction. What rules would make sense no matter what? And when we're thinking about all those contingent what-if scenarios, I could be rich, I could be poor, I could be the criminal, I could be the innocent civilian, I, all these different possibilities. Um, I'm not thinking about whether a contradiction is going to happen because my desires are different in those different scenarios. Kant says really famously, um, at one point of it, in, in another book he wrote on morality, The Critique of Practical Judgment, he says, um, the criminal, were they to be fully rational, like to consider things from a rational point of view, could definitely approve of their own punishment even if they fear or don't desire that punishment. So it's kind of like if I'm the criminal, I'm guilty of wrongdoing. I did some bad, I assaulted someone, um, and now I'm going to face jail time or something like that. Um, I may not want to go to jail. I'm like, that doesn't sound like fun to me. And I might be afraid of it. Like, I'm, I'm nervous about it. Like, nervous like going to the dentist or something. Um, uh, well, on a little higher scale, maybe. Um, and those are emotional things that'll make me think, this is not good. This is not, I don't want this to happen. I don't want this to happen. But if I'm, I, if I kind of filter out that emotional noise and look at this thing from a rational point of view, I could be like, what are the values that are getting respected by me being punished. And I'd be like, that makes sense. Yeah, I really should be punished. I, I deserve that. Or or maybe deserving is going to be weird here for Kant because of something we're going to talk about in a second. But maybe that it makes sense. This is, this is the rule that should be followed. This is the universal rule that I could affirm. Even though it's applying to me in a way I don't desire, that I don't think is conducive to my happiness, I could see how it's good. There's rules that could work like that. And if that seems weird to you, it's probably not weird to you. That would be my guess. Because there's all sorts of circumstances in which, uh, in ordinary life, where there's something that we may not want for ourselves, but we judge to be good. And so we do it anyway. Like, um, like uh, well, my, fav my favorite example is really this. Uh, people that we love and cherish and care for, like the people, the people who really ma matter in our lives that we care for deeply, they don't always make us happy, right? Like uh, caring about them is not always something that brings pleasure and joy. Sometimes it does, and and when it does, it's great. It's a good thing. And Kant wouldn't say no to that either. Um, but you're, if you really care about someone, you're gonna do what's good for them, um, no matter how it's making you feel. And that's how Kant feels about morality, too. In fact, he has a little footnote in the grounding about love. He says love's not an emotion. It's an action. If you really care about the other person, then you're caring about what's happening for them, whether they're in a good place, not about whether caring for them makes you feel good, right? Whether you value them because they bring you pleasure, but you value them as something for their own sake, okay? And that's the same thing that Kant's thinking about morality, too. It's got to make sense on its own, individually, not because of how I feel about it. So when I'm looking for contradictions in my will, I'm not thinking about what I would, what I would want or not want under these different situations. But we could bring it in the, in the sense of this, like um, the feelings that we have, like what kind of psychology we have, definitely is maybe part of the circumstances of what we have to make a judgment about. And that's another really important point about Kant that I wanted to slip in here sooner or later. Even though Kant's saying that moral action is done from reason, that doesn't mean he's saying we should be emotionally oblivious or unintelligent. Like, emotional intelligence is pretty important for Kant. Um, emotions can be relevant for doing your moral duty. Uh, not may maybe that they're driving the car, that, in other words, like acting off of inclinations, but in terms of maybe informing what rational rule makes sense. And I'll give you a really quick, quick, easy example. My brother, when we were growing up, uh, very close in age, my younger brother, and he was kind of a hothead. I was kind of the cool one, the cool-headed, sort of even keel, 
kid and my brother was like really emotional and because he was so emotional I wasn't he always was interested in kind of trying to get my goat and stuff but anyway my mom told him one time because he would like you know get really frustrated and then he would do something destructive and angry and my mom gave him advice you know a lot of parents give to kids who are trying to wrestle with this and be like when you're feeling angry instead of punching your brother or something go to your room punch your pillow so that's like a maxim, right? That's a uh, a conditional judgment. It's a hypothetical judgment, um, but maybe it's the right idea. Maybe it passes the categorical imperative as like a good idea that, that this is something that can be followed. But notice how the rule, even though it's a rational rule, is sensitive to emotional conditions, right? It's saying when you're feeling angry, here would be the good thing to do to deal with your anger, right? Um, that's really different from just like acting on anger directly. Kant's going to say, no, that's, that's not an action with moral worth. It's your will is being taken over by something else. But when I, if I'm going to be self-determining, if I'm going to be giving laws to myself, self-generated laws, writing my own programming, there's no reason I can't have that program informed by the emotional realities that are a part of my circumstances. The same as the external circumstances. I can have maxims and rules that are conditional and sensitive to differences between different circumstances. And that also could happen for our inner worlds. Different people have different personality types. They experience emotions differently in different situations. And you could have rules for conduct under Kant that uh, take in those things into account. So if you're like, got anger management issues, you know, here's the thing that you should do with that. Okay. So the, the rules can be universalized. Uh, in a way that is maybe informed by emotions and could be universalized without contradiction in spite of emotional differences too. Okay. So those are some pretty important details about the, the early going version of the categorical imperative. Um, I said I was going to take a break, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for the home stretches. Uh, those of you in the chat um, who's still here, uh, do you want a break or should we just keep trucking? Okay. Yeah. I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, it gets gets pretty late here. Um thanks for the feedback. I will I will I'm happy to keep going too. Um I'm going to grab just a little bit of water. Um but it'll take me just 2 seconds. Okay, here we go. So, we're right on the cusp on the most exciting part of Kant's moral philosophy. This is where the rubber really hits the road and where we start getting something super substantial, something that's a lot more like a robust moral vision. Um, and that's Kant's third formulation of the categorical imperative, um, the, the one that famously talks about respect for persons. Now, how we get here is needs to be talked about very carefully. There's a lot of ways to misunderstand this. Um, but uh, <clears throat> basically, Kant starts here. If we know up until this point that moral actions are going to be actions that are self-determining, if they're done from reason, by self-generated laws. Um, what goes on with that? If I am going to give myself rules for my own action, that means I have to respect reason. On my little diagram here um, from before, you might have no noticed up at self-generated laws, there's a little bubble pointing at it that says, also requires respect. Basically, Kant says, if I think of a rule, that doesn't mean I'm going to act on it. Maybe it seems like some people work like that. A thought goes in the head, they act a certain way. But really, I can have any, I can think of a rule, but if I don't respect the rule, I'm not going to act on it. So I was talking about this with my students earlier this afternoon. I used the example of like, every time someone says the word purple, start taking your shirt off. I'd be like, I can think of that rule. Just thinking about it doesn't mean I'm going to follow it. I mean, I'm going, if I don't respect it, right? So acting on my reasons or my intentions or the rules that I'm capable of constructing through reason requires respect for reason. If I don't respect the faculty of reason as having authority for determining my will, then I'm not going to follow it. Um, Kant thinks it's a matter of necessity that I have to respect my own reason. Um, and that might seem a little weird. You might be able to imagine someone who um, has like a lot of self-doubt um, or like negative self-talk voices um, or who um, 
is not confident, has low self-esteem in their own judgment, and defers to other people's judgment, other people's judgment all the time. That maybe they don't respect their own reason. They could be suspicious of it, like they think it might be biased, like it, they might have biases that are influencing their uh, judgment. Um, but if they take that position, if they adopt that stance, they're not truly doubting their faculty of reason. And here's the reason why. In order to doubt some specific judgments that their reasoning created, they have to endorse the judgment that they're biased, or that those judgments are illegitimate, or vulnerable to skepticism, or something like that. That's also a judgment of reason. So it's actually impossible for me to um, sort of give myself some direction about how I ought to act that doesn't at the same time sort of treat myself as legitimately having the authority or the position to set my ends for myself. So there's kind of a, a necessary self-dignity that I give to myself, that my relationship to myself is always as something that gives its ends to itself. Even if I've internalized a lot of like negative self-image sort of stuff. Like, like let's say I was um, uh, an oppressed slave and everyone in the culture is telling me I'm less than human and I don't matter, like like Holocaust kind of scenario, like being in a concentration camp and I internalize all of this stuff and I do think of myself as shit and blah, 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 blah. Even in that moment, I'm making judgments of value that I'm endorsing through my dignity of being able to make judgments of value, right? And so Kant's kind of saying, this is inescapable. This is a formal feature of existence um, and having a will, a rational will, that I'm going to, of necessity, treat myself as something intrinsically valuable. And, and all that he means by that is that I'm a thing that generates ends for itself rather than my entire being being a means for some other end that's outside of myself. And, and that's the kind of idea of slavery, right? To use a person as a tool for some other objective, for some other goal, some other end, rather than a person being an end in themselves, as being the thing that sets the final goal. Okay, so, so Kant's saying to do this, this is a little fuzzy and abstract. So if it's, if it's uh, if hard following it, don't beat yourself up. It makes total sense. This is kind of tricky. Um, Kant's saying, I of necessity respect myself as the kind of being that gives its ends to itself. Okay, fair enough. Now, if that's how I necessarily treat myself on the grounds that I have a rational faculty, then under pain of contradiction, using the first two formulations of the categorical imperative, I have to extend that same dignity to any other being that has reason. So any other being that thinks about what they do, and that's all we mean by reason. It's just, uh, it's a faculty that lets me construct conceptual rules that guide my own will. Any being that can do that, I have to treat as intrinsically valuable. It means other humans, non-human animals that have sentience, alien species that are sentient that maybe we haven't met yet, like in some science fiction scenario. That's why this is an ethic that isn't just for humans. It's across the board for any type of person taken in this very abstract philosophical sense of just a thing that thinks about its own action, has this kind of sentience, right, self-awareness, and can construct rules for its own action through reason. Um, anything that qualifies for that, I have to treat as intrinsically valuable, as an end in itself. And that's the third formulation of the categorical imperative. Whenever you act, Act in such a way that you treat all persons as ends in themselves and not simply as a means for some other end. There, let, let's unpack this a little bit more. There's many ways in which we treat each other as means for other ends. In fact, a really big example is what's happening right now. Um, there's a kind of uh, transaction that's taking place in our relationship. Um, teaching students is what gives me a paycheck. I get money out of it. If you weren't here, I wouldn't get the money. I wouldn't, I'd have to find some other way to make my livelihood. 
So are you a means to my livelihood? Yeah, you are. Um, does that mean that I'm treating you like a slave? I could be. And that's the honest truth about it. If I thought of you only as a paycheck and my commitment or investment in you only as a only as a means for acquiring a paycheck, then I'm violating the categorical imperative. I'm violating the moral law according to Kant if I treated you that way. Now, I hope I don't treat you that way. And this is where it's like you never really know, right? But what I strive for and what I aim for, I mean, I, I can what I can report even if I'm wrong or misguided about my own understanding of myself, is that I do respect you as something intrinsically valuable. And I'm a teacher not just because it gets me a paycheck, but I think that I'm I'm trying to do something good. Do I ever do something good? Like is giving these lectures and, and teaching and stuff always putting my students in a better off position? I don't know. I mean, it would be arrogant for me to assume that I'm always bringing some kind of value to my students. But I, I, tr I try. I, that's my goal. That's my aim. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's why I'm behaving the way that I'm behaving with respect to you. And when I'm motivated that way, if that's my reason, remember again for Kant, if an action's going to have moral worth, it depends on why it is being done. If it's being done from an end that is treating you as something intrinsically valuable, I want what's good for you just because that's what's good for you, for no other reason than that. Then in that way, I'm treating you as an end. So that's why the categorical imperative here is uh, there's an emphasis on treating people solely as a means. Because you can be part of a means ends sort of thing for me, like with my livelihood, without it meaning that that's all I'm seeing you as, that my actions aren't also motivated from something that respects you as having value for your own sake. Okay, so that combo can happen. Um, same thing for you. Um, you could treat your interaction with me and the value that I have solely in terms of what you can get out of me, which might be a grade, might be credit, it might even be wisdom. Even something more idealistic like that would still be treating me as a means. I'm just, I'm just like a. a food to be consumed or something like that. I'm a commodity to suck dry or something like that. Um, and that would be disrespectful. Um, that That's disrespecting my value, my intrinsic value as a person as well, if that's the only way that you treated me. Now, students can treat me as a means, and I invite it. I mean, I've been saying all these things like, contact me whenever, like I want to help. Um, but there's a way that you, as a student, could... Uh, use me as a means for some other end, whether that's your own wisdom or credits or graduating or whatever, and still at the same time respect me as an end in myself. Um, how would that look? As a student, I mean, there's some things like, as there's some ways of trying to respect me as a person that I actually actively discourage, like being worried that you're going to bother me and stuff like that. But maybe this analogy would be good. When you go to the grocery store, <clears throat> if you're not using the automated checkout line, if there's a human cashier, right? Uh, that cashier is a means for you acquiring the food. Without them as a piece of the machine, without as a cog in the machine, you wouldn't be able to walk out of there with your food. So they're a means to your ends of procuring, procuring your groceries. Now, uh, could you just use them like a tool? Like you treat them the same way you treat the automated machine? Yeah, you could. And oftentimes we do and Kant would say that's not right. But you could also be like, hey, how's it going? Well, how's your day going? Or just like look them in the eyes and address them. Um, maybe smile. Maybe not treat them like shit. Um, those sorts of things are acknowledgments of a person being a person. That, they, that what happens to them matters for their own sake. There's ways that that can be expressed. Uh, gratitude for is, is one way, right? You don't say thank you to the machine when you're checking out at Safeway or something. But if you say, like, thank you to the cashier, it's like a gesture of acknowledging, hey, I see you as a person who's contributed to this good thing for me, and you need to be addressed with respect and acknowledged as a thing that has value for your sake as well. Now, can you also say thank you to people in an insincere way? Yeah, of course. But again, it matters what is the sincerity, whether it's sincere or insincere. Like, what's the motive and reason behind it? And that's going to determine the moral worth of the action. So with the third formulation of the categorical imperative, we get something really significant. We get this moral obligation 
to treat people as ends in themselves, as things intrinsically valuable. And that's that's a big deal. This can serve as a basis for uh, conventions like human rights, which is uh, Kant is often used as a foundation for human rights. Um, it also uh, is where we get the idea of dignity and respect, moral dignity and respect, and also, and this is a big one, freedom. Because the basis of our dignity, the basis of how we have intrinsic value, is our capacity to be self-determining. This, this faculty of reason, which allows me to exist as an end in myself. To give myself my own ends is what reason does. Um, and, and it should be noted here, Kant is not saying that people who are not empowered as agents don't deserve our respect. The, just the, in virtue of having the capacity of doing this is what makes us intrinsically valuable according to Kant. Or why we have this moral obligation to treat people as ends in themselves instead of as means or as tools for some other end. Um, so that's a pretty big deal. And... These reflections by Kant start to give some shape to what it is to care about people. To treat them as intrinsically valuable is not just a matter of um, manipulating them. That, that's a classic one. Slavery is right out. Rape is a pretty clear example of someone being used as a person, being used as a tool or means for somebody else's ends. Um, all that kind of exploitive behavior is ruled out. But it's not just a matter of the don'ts. It's also a matter of the do's, that to respect someone as an end in themselves, in virtue of this capacity of being self-determining, means, according to Kant, this is my reading of Kant, maybe it's a little little hat turny, but not a very big hat turny, I don't think this is too controversial a reading, I think Kant's categorical imperative gives us an active and positive mandate to be concerned about helping other people, caring for them, um, to be self-determining. That we, it's our job to try to empower other people, not just get in the way of their agency, but to try to promote their agency, to uh, enable them to be self-determining. And that's what I talk about as Kantian care, that if you really care about a person for their own sake, you want what's good for them. And Kant's providing a vision of what does it look, what is good for a person, and what's good for them is to be free, to be self-determining. How do you do that? Through reason. How are you going to make reason as the thing that is controlling your will? Well, by playing by the rules of logic, not contradicting yourself. Not acting from inclinations, which co-opt your will. It's not you who's responsible for it. But through intentional reflective action that's logically consistent. So that gives us some more positive duties toward each other and how we should be treating each other. Um, we should be uh, treating each other with respect, which means respecting that people are autonomous, um, that they have this capacity to be self-determining, and to the extent to which they are not using it or it isn't developed, we have an obligation to help promote that, to empower people. And that's all what we get from the third formulation of the categorical imperative. That's the blood that we get when we're talking about like squeezing the stone, getting the blood out of the stone kind of thing. Um, and that's what's like really exciting about Kant and why people are interested in him and, and I think find this to be a kind of compelling story of morality is that maybe Kant really is able to derive something that's a little more rich here and and really ends up setting the moral bar pretty high. Um, I think utilitarianism sets the bar really high. I think Kant sets the bar really high here too. Um, it's really hard to be self-determining on your own, much less caring for other people about it. Um, and there's so many temptations to treat people uh, as not intrinsically valuable uh, to de dehumanizing them, like the, if we think dehumanizing people is something immoral, Kant gives you a really good theory to explain why. Um, that it always involves contradicting your own will. Right? That there's a universal dignity that all people have. Um, this kind of uh, active care and concern I think is pretty important to emphasize in Kant's vision because sometimes the the preoccupation with Kant sort of centralizing freedom as the most important moral value um, can sometimes justify some positions that I don't think Kant would be down with, like uh, meritocratic systems or total like free market capitalism, like a libertarian ideal. I don't think is really going to be Kantian 
but we'll talk more about this as we go. There's there's some dispute and controversy around that, um, but this is going to be one of those places where you know Kant is setting the stage and giving us the theoretical language for understanding some of these other disputes that are going to happen in business ethics. But so more, stay tuned on that as we go forward. Um, before I wrap up things tonight, though, I want to revisit a couple things that I promised um, that I don't think we've gotten to yet. Um, and it, particularly, let's go back to happiness. Now, now that we've got the third formulation of the categorical imperative, um, we can revisit what is Kant going to say about happiness. Um, and he says it's a good of some kind. Uh, it's not an intrinsically valuable thing. It's not unconditionally good the way that people are unconditionally valuable, um, that we have these necessary obligations to treat them as, as ends in themselves. Or this thing about like never contradicting yourself, that's always good. It, happiness isn't going to work like that. Um, but uh, he is going to say it is some kind of good. So how does it fit in here within the framework of the categorical imperative? Well, he's got two things, two, two ways to reintegrate happiness. The first one is this. I need to be tracking happiness in some ways because, he says, people that are unhappy are more inclined to not do their duty. Their unhappiness is an inclination which distracts away from reason and from being self-determining. Kind of like if I'm starving to death, I'm really tempted to steal the bread, right? Um, or to maybe mug someone to get the money I need to survive or something like that. The, the temptations get higher in egregious circumstances or ten, high tension situations um, when things aren't going well. So if, I'm, if things aren't going well for me, if I'm really deeply unhappy and dissatisfied, um, I'm more at risk of harming other people or treating other people as a means to my ends, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. disrespecting others. Um, so I should, in as much as I have an obligation to empower people to be self-determining and thus following the moral law, um, to be able to do the moral law, to be morally good, then I need to be concerned about their happiness. Uh, to try to um, contribute to their happiness when that doesn't get into trouble with the categorical imperative, um, when it's not like paternalistic uh, or exploitive or something like that, uh, but also to avoid taking actions which cause unhappiness if it can be avoided. So again, this stuff is contingent. It's not; Those aren't necessary rules for Kant. Uh, and we need to kind of figure out what are the circumstances, where's that line drawn, and see whether that line drawing is universalizable according to the categorical imperative. But he makes room for that. He thinks that there's theoretical room for being concerned about happiness as a secondary duty that we have toward people, but not as a primary one. But then there's another fun argument that he makes. He says, if anything else, um, I should be concerned about people's happiness and unhappiness only for the reason that I cannot universalize without contradiction any maxim which instructs me to harm people, to make them unhappy. There, there's no way that I can universalize a maxim that tells me to do that. Um, so kind of uh, in a negative proof sort of way, I have to be concerned about happiness. Like a concern about people's intrinsic value and to not contradict myself um, backs me into concern about happiness. Uh, so I think that's kind of a funny funny aspect of Kant's philosophy too. So happiness is not thrown completely under the bus here. But it's contextualized. Uh, Kant's not saying it's a fundamental value. Uh, but it's something that comes later. Kind of like, and this is where you might be thinking about Mill versus Kant and back and forth. I mean that move by Kant is, is not the same move, but it's the same kind of maneuver as um, Mill attempting to show that he doesn't have a problem with justice, it's just not a fundamental moral value, right? Justice for Mill only gets value in as much as it promotes utility. So um, it's kind of similar to that. Kant's like, you know what? Utility has conditional value as long as it's fulfilling these requirements of justice, like the, this necessary law of the categorical imperative. So it makes for an interesting debate, you know, which side should, which one's got the right measure of this. And that's why I'm always wanting you to think about this, these ideas critically as we're going through the class, because the, you can't have your cake and eat it too here. You can't say yes to Mill and to Kant. Uh, you might be able to put certain pieces together. I think there's actually some possibilities for that um, uh, in the work that I've done on ethics myself, my original work. I think there is some possibility for that. But 
you know the whole thing. If you take all of Kant, all of Mill, they're not they're they're going to fight like cats and dogs. They're not going to fit. Um, so, so the, that's what Kant says about happiness. Um, there's something else I was thinking about. Oh yeah. Um, before we leave Kant completely behind, I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about evil in Kant. Um, and right now this video is clocked in at an hour and fifty minutes. It's ten oh six. Um, hmm. I'm thinking about saving it for next time, or maybe just doing it now. Let me just give you the really quick couple minute version. Um, for those of you in the chat, I know it's getting late. Um, so I'll try to wrap this up. Uh, and by the way, code word. Uh, how about um, provolone? That's a really dumb one, but I just said it, so sorry. That's our word for tonight, provolone. Uh, and I'll get that started up soon. Ah, uh, spell it. <laughs> um, okay, how about just this? Cheese. Provolone's a kind of cheese. Cheese is a code word. That'll work. Um, so you can just put cheese in there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure I can spell provolone off the top of my head. Yeah, I'll probably screw that up. So cheese is fine. Cheese is the code word. Uh, okay. Um, so Kant and evil. The bottom line is this. So if we're th we've been talking a lot about what does it mean to follow the categorical imperative? What does it demand? What is it asking for? What does it mean to respect people as ends in themselves? All that kind of stuff. Um, what does it mean for things that go wrong? We've talked a little bit about this, but let me give you a kind of a quick rundown of the actual mechanics of it. Like, how could I will in action that isn't in accordance with the categorical imperative? There's three options. First option, I don't use reason at all when I act. I'm just acting purely off inclinations. It's like a reaction, like an emotional reaction, not thinking. Um, I'm not controlling my will. I'm basically on autopilot. So that's that's an action that wouldn't have moral worth. But it's also a case where I'm not really responsible. Right? I'm not I didn't decide on the laws of psychology that are controlling my will. This is when I'm just like a boulder. And we don't morally evaluate boulders. We don't think boulders can be immoral or moral based on them rolling down hills and hurting people or something. They're like, no, the boulders didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything. And we are sometimes like boulders. When we're on psychological autopilot, when we're not using reason intentionally to act, Kant says we're just not moral objects in that moment. We're not capable of moral evaluation. Now you could say if someone chooses to go into autopilot, then that's a problem. Like if I um, if I choose to shoot up heroin right before my lecture, once I've shot up heroin, now I'm useless. <laughs> I don't I don't have a lot of agency in that moment. Um, but I had agency that put me in that position, which is kind of why, like, um, I, this is kind of similar to, um, uh, like, drunk driving, right? Like, it's not like people get drunk and then they get really excited about running people over and killing them. That's not how alcohol works. The problem is that you make an intentional choice that puts you in a position where now you're not able to be intentional, right? You're impaired in your driving, and then something can happen. Are you responsible for that? Well, it's not the same as you intentionally running someone over to kill them. But you are morally responsible for injury with drunk driving. Why? Because you made the choice that put you in that position, that compromised your agency. And that you could be held accountable for. Um, so there's a way that, that, that there, this isn't like some kind of loophole to get out of moral responsibility. Okay, option two. I engage reason... But I only reason via hypothetical imperatives. I never get to a categorical imperative. And remember, hypotheticals are like, do this for the sake of that. This thing is contingently good depending on that other thing. And then you're like, okay, well, when is that good? Well, that depends on this other thing. Depends on the other thing. Depends on the other thing. Depends on the other thing. Do this for that, for that, for that. Why? Because of this. Why? Because of this. Why? Because of this. And, it, and that always leaves that hanging thread. If you had a categorical imperative put in there sooner or later. Like, do this for the sake of that, do that for the sake of this. Why to do this? For its own sake. It's just good, all the time, no matter what. Then that settles it. That ends the whole logical string. That grounds it. Um, there's no passing the buck any further from that. But if I don't do that, if I don't, like, there's nothing wrong with hypothetical imperatives, according to Kant. They just don't provide the foundation. They don't settle everything. They leave it hanging. So if they leave it hanging and I act on them, there's something that's going to be determining my will. 
It's just not going to be reason. Reason, Kant says, is only partially determining the end in this scenario. And guess what's going to fill in the power vacuum? Inclinations. So this situation of reasoning via only hypothetical imperatives, again, the real thing that's driving the car are my inclinations, my psychology, my desires, things like that. So, um, again... If, I'm, if all of my reasoning is really being driven forward by my inclinations, then it's again an, a sort of way in which I'm like a boulder. Okay? Reason's not fully determined in the end. I'm not fully self-determined when I do that. This is called rationalizing. <laughs> rationalizing is when I'm using reason, but reason isn't running the game. It isn't running the show. I'm not determining my own ends. I'm just using reason to rationalize something I've already decided that I care about for other reasons. And kids do this all the time. Like a kid tries to argue into letting them stay up late. Why do they want to stay up late? Not because they're like, I've carefully considered this situation rationally. And I think objectively, a, letter, a later bedtime creates more value and meaning in the world. Or is respecting me as an end of myself. Or crap like that. Like, they're not thinking that way. They're not like, hmm, what would be objectively better? What's a, what's a maxim I can universalize here? They're not thinking that. They're, they want to stay up, and they're just looking for an excuse that'll get you to let them do it. or something. Like kids are kind of transparent about their rationalizing. Well, adults still rationalize. We're just maybe a little less transparent about it, and it's harder to detect. But Kant definitely thinks that's a big issue. So this is when the faculty of reason is being driven by emotions, desires, and that's really setting the end. Third way things can go wrong for Kant. Um, I engage reason. In thinking about what I'm going to do, I'm acting reflectively, and I reason to the categorical imperative. I'm thinking about the hypotheticals, do this for the sake of that, for the sake of that, and I do end up grounding that with a, a recognition, a rational recognition of what my objective duty is. Like that I need to respect people as ends in themselves, that I shouldn't be lying, I shouldn't be stealing, this kind of stuff. Um, but yet, I don't respect it. In this third scenario, there's no problem with my thinking. Reasoning is working fine. I'm just not respecting reason. I'm like, yeah, I know that's the rule, but I'm not going to follow it right now. I'm just not going to do that. That's another way things can go wrong. If I'm considering what reason demands, and I'm not following it because I don't respect it, then something has to be drawing away my respect. What could do that? Well, there's really only one theoretical candidate for Kant. It's, again, inclinations. So all of these situations where my action fails to be in accordance with the categorical imperative, one thing to note is all of these cases mean I'm not acting fully on reason. And to the extent that I'm not acting from reason, I'm not being self-determined, which means I'm not free. My uh, freedom for Kant is really being constrained by the logical law, moral law. It's sort of maybe backwards from how we usually think about freedom. Uh, this has been a debate that's been going on in the history of philosophy all the way back to Socrates. Some people think of freedom as the power to do what I want. Kant and other people think that freedom is for me to subject my will to a law. To constrain my action is what it means to be free. Self-determining is imposing laws on myself. To be self-determining. To be in self-control. And that's what Kant's saying here, too. If I'm going to be self-determining, the only way I can do this is consistent with the laws of logic because I need reason to conceptually create rules for me to act on. That's how I can be self-determining. So I'm subject to all those laws. The extent to which I don't play by those rules is the extent to which I'm not able to control my own actions. And they're being controlled for me by laws of nature that I did not design or approve of or enforce. They just happen to me. I'm just passive in that situation. I'm not controlling my own will. So for Kant, immoral action is really just unfree action. And in a weird sort of way, I think this helps to back up Kant's claim that everyone has intrinsic value, even if they're not exercising their capacity of being self-determining. Do those people annoy us? Yeah, they do, right? Like people who are not acting free are annoying. Um, they're like not responsible. You can't count on them. You can't trust them. You might get annoyed with yourself for being untrustworthy and unreliable. I definitely have experienced that many, many times. Where I'm like, ah, I wish I didn't have this psychology. I wish I didn't. I, w I wish I was more reliable. 
Uh, my my younger self had 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 that kind of I had those kinds of experiences, um, and then being a teacher's kind of helped with that. <laughs> it's really locked things down because um, you have to be a lot more responsible as a teacher. Um, but uh, but you you could be frustrated with yourself about this too. It can be annoying. But Kant says we you still have a moral obligation to these people to help encourage them to be empowered. Why? Well, because when they're doing wrong things, they're not really the ones who are acting. They're to be pitied. Uh, we can sort of take it personally. Like, we can try to imagine that someone intentionally is trying to do harm to us. But Kant, if Kant's right, you can't intentionally violate the categorical imperative. Why? Because the thing that enables you to make an intention is the categorical imperative. The only way that you could actually contradict it is if inclinations were hijacking your will and working against what reason is saying. Reason cannot will its own destruction. That's what Kant, that's basically Kant's point. I can't use logic to destroy logic. It's not possible. So this is, I think that's a really interesting thing that's very idiosyncratic about Kant and is not always talked about so heavily, but it is a logical consequence of Kant. Um, it, it connects with, even if you've done evil things, you still have intrinsic value and we still have moral obligations to you. That's actually something I was saying Mill agrees to as well. His egalitarianism does not differentiate on a meritocratic sort of system. Um, can meritocracy fit into a Kantian ethic? Well, Kant thinks so. He's got a lot of meritocratic um, moral intuitions, and in certain other places where he comments on issues, he brings up those kinds of rules. But maybe not. You wouldn't have to commit to meritocracy under a Kantian system. And I think there's actually, if you're asking me, there's some aspects of Kant's theory here that resist getting folded into a meritocratic way of looking at people's moral worth. Or definitely not their moral worth, but definitely how we should treat them, like what obligations we have to people. Do we, um, do, in other words, do people who are more self-determining and acting more in accordance with what morality de demands, are they more deserving of happiness, for example? Yeah, maybe you could find a way to universalize a maxim like that, but I think there's some parts about Kant that are, like the theory he's set up resists some of that stuff. But anyway, that's another kind of debate and discussion you could have. Um, bottom line, Kant thinks all immoral action is unfree action. So intentional wrongdoing, which is I think sometimes the idea we have in mind when we hear this word evil, there's a difference between me accidentally doing something that harms you versus intentionally doing something that harms you because it is wrong or something. Um, that would be evil, right? Um, but, uh, but, but Kant would say that sort of thing is not theoretically possible. People who do immoral actions are disempowered. They're to be pitied. They, that's a sign that they, does, they need care. Um, they need some help uh, to become empowered because they're not doing it under their own power right now. And their immoral actions are evidence of that. If they were really free, they wouldn't do those things. If they were really self-determining, there's no way they could perform those actions. Pretty interesting. <laughs> also kind of a challenge to us. Uh, we have a tendency to think that we're pretty self-determining, but we're not always treating other people the way the third formulation of the categorical imperative is asking us to. So, um, so more food for, food for thought. Tough, tough times. Um, tough words from Kant. Um, okay, I'm going to cut the video. That's two hours. Um, there's so much stuff to talk about. This is a crash course, so we can't do everything. Um, I'm happy about the level of detail we were able to get into this lecture tonight in two hours, so I'm feeling pretty satisfied about that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I think we'll cut it off for here, and you got the code word already, and I think we're, we're good. So I will, um, I hope you have a great weekend, people on YouTube out there. Definitely, as always, if you got questions, and Kant's tough, I, I'm guessing you got questions. I want to answer your questions. This format doesn't let me do a lot of that, the online thing. So uh, if you want to talk, uh, I, I haven't had many phone conversations with all of you um, uh, so far this quarter, and I wish I did. I wish I had some more contact with you. Um, if, if anything's going on um, that you want to explore this stuff more or clarify things or double-check whether you got the right idea of it, um, I'd like to do that. I'm going to try to do that with some comments on the journals like I was mentioning on my Monday lecture, but um, yeah, bandwidth on that is, is a little tight this week. I'm, like I said, I'm not as far as long as I wish I was with journals, grading them. Um, I'm going to try to get them done.
by the end of the weekend, I think. Um, and I'll try to get some feedback on there. But again, if you don't get feedback and you wanted it, let me know. We can talk about that too. But yeah, I want to give you support in this class. And so far, not many people have been asking for it. So, I mean, it's up to you. But um, I'm just guessing that probably uh, some support might be helpful. But uh, So take me up on it. I've, I'm, I'm free. Doors open. Okay. Have a great weekend. I'll see you around.